Well, good morning, good afternoon, or wherever you are in the world. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Open Minded. Amazing to have Dr. Hilary Bennett with me today. Dr. Hilary and I have been doing some work um, with Mentimia about a whole lot of different stuff that I won't get into now because we'll cover it during the podcast, but it's just fantastic that I get um, a little bit more time with her to, to sort of dig a bit deeper. Sometimes when you do uh, webinars and that you've got you know other people asking questions and I've always been really intrigued so you know Dr Hillary has been with us for a little while she is the director of leading safety consultancy specializing in safety leadership safety culture human factors and workplace health and safety so what a topic this is the topic that I'm talking about all the time she's also a registered psychologist and works with organizations across all sectors to develop safe and healthy workplaces. She has a particular interest in mental health, which is awesome, and well-being at work and was the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award at the New Zealand Health and Safety Awards in 2019. So lovely to see you, Hilary. Tell me, where did you get this passion from for this sector? I mean, because it hasn't been very trendy up until just recently, to be fair. Yeah, uh, uh, an interesting story, JK. So um, I, um, as a I, I went to boarding school as a child. And uh, when I finished school, I was going to, I signed up to become a um, physiotherapist. And at that time, my parents moved um, to a town where all of a sudden I could live at home and go to university and study. And I said, well, I don't think I'll be a physiotherapist. I'll go and live at home for a while and I'll be a, come a psychologist. <laughs> so it was really a matter, it really wasn't a very considered choice. But when I trained, um, we had to make a choice very early on in our studies as to whether we wanted to do clinical psychology or organizational psychology. And at that point in time, so I think I'm in my early twenties now, I actually chose the organizational route because in my mind, it was an area where I could work proactively. And so the work, my interest in mentally healthy work probably goes back a good 40 years. Um, and I've traveled in many different directions. And um, it's, I feel like I've come full circle in terms of my work. I feel like I've, I've gone out and explored a whole lot of things, but come home to my, my, my true north, which is a passion for proactively developing workplaces where people can thrive and where work doesn't actually harm people. So yeah, it's been a long, a long journey, um, but I'm really pleased to be back re working strongly in the space. It's really interesting because if you had a chosen physiotherapy on all the rugby tours I used to go to, the physio is always half a psychologist anyway, because he, <laughs> because he had to be, because we're in there either beaten up, feeling sorry for ourselves or missing home. But I mean, 20, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, I mean, even up until recently, Dr. Hillary, it hasn't been trendy. No. And, you know, we often talk about it, me and Tamir, together. You know, you can't fix the fish if the water's toxic. But I have, I, I talk to a whole lot of leaders, but they don't actually know um, what psychological safety is. So can you, in your opinion, with all this knowledge, can you just tell me, if I was a CEO, what psychological safety at its best, would look like and be in the workplace? Um, at its best, I think it is where people can be who they are, no matter who they are, um, that they are, they have, they have a sense of belonging, they feel they're part of a, a, you know, a particular group, which is a real human need for all of us, is to feel connected with other people. So as a starting point, it's you know, acceptance of who we are, a sense of belonging. But then added on to that is that our sense that we can actually speak up, no matter how silly the idea might be, how left field the idea might be, and that our views will be accepted and considered, not initially always agreed on, um, that we can feel we can challenge people. So it's about creating a situation where people feel that they can be who they really are in the workplace, I think is, is the real basics of that psychological safety. We talk about, um, you know, creating an environment when you bring, where you bring your authentic self. And I think the biggest challenge for me was I was one of those people that wouldn't bring their, their self. And I don't know if it was um, culturally, I don't know if it was, anyone's fault but I just wouldn't so how much responsibility is you know on the leader versus actually the individual because if we're going to get this right um, there is still the stigma around me actually being 
you know, authentic. I spoke to someone the other day and I said, your ability is not your mental health, right? That's why we're dealing in prevention because we don't, you're, you know, a great accountant or you're a great salesperson or whatever, you're a great person at, at, on the construction line, whatever that is. Um, but if you don't bring your authentic self, it could cause mental health problems. So how, how much, what's the balance? How do you yeah, deal I, with that? I, I think there's always, I mean, there's always dual care. So, you know, if, if you go to good health and safety language, everybody has a duty of care to themselves and others. So mm -hmm. everyone has a responsibility um, to a look after themselves um, and, and to, to be themselves. However, it's actually the leaders in an organization who um, have the responsibility to create a, a, the, a working place where people are able to be their authentic selves. So I think it's not that so much that people choose not to be who they want to be. It's that sometimes it's very difficult for people to be who they want to be in, in a workplace. And that is a leadership issue. That is leaders create the culture that exists within an organization. They create that psychological safety. And when I mean leaders, I'm not necessarily meaning someone with a word supervisor or manager behind the, their name. You know, leadership is about influence. So in, in many ways, anyone could be a leader in an organization, but you know, my experiences is very often those frontline leaders who really are interacting with people on a regular basis that it's fundamentally important that they are able to make people feel um, safe. And by safe, I don't mean that they feel comfortable in the sense that they can just go with things. And by safe, I don't mean to say that you can just say anything you like and actually hurt people or harm people by what you say. There has to be a personal responsibility that when you speak up, that you do it with good intent. <laughs> I love that one because I want to investigate that a wee bit more because often you're, you know, there's now these, these, uh, I, and I think a lot of this is generational, right? And you'll understand that. I've come from a different generation. Um, I, I've been living in different cultures where in one culture it might be offensive. But the old famous, oh, I was just being honest, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, how, do we, how do we create the right, the right conversation? I often talk about it being performance care. I can still love you, but I've got to be able to, or not love, love probably a little bit too hard in the, in the work environment, but, um, you know, I still care for you, but you still got to perform. How, how does a leader sit down, especially at the end of a year like this, where we don't know what hybrid, um, you know, workplaces are going to look like. Some people feel that they might be hiding behind Zooms or whatever. There's a whole lot of suspicion out there. No one's fault, just COVID. So how do you start those conversations where it's what we call performance care? So you are generally looking after someone, but that person also has to do their job. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a real tricky one, JK, because um, I know from some of the work I've been doing with various uh, mental health support organizations internationally is they always say we have to be really careful the point at which what should be a well-being conversation very quickly becomes a performance conversation and therefore we lose the, the sense that we do really care. So this is not an easy area for us to go in. Um, but I think it really does depend on how you how the, how the manager or the supervisor goes into that conversation and, and whether the, the, the main focus is on you simply not doing your job, we need to sort that out, is to a genuine curiosity to understand why is this person not performing and what might be the range of factors that might be influencing. And, and you know, they may be personal factors. And I know many, many organizations really struggle with the fact that the personal stuff fills, you know, spills over into the home life. But that's the reality, isn't it? We don't, we don't separate our work and home. You know, it's all it's all mixed up in, in one thing for us. So I think it's about, you know, when that when that person goes into the conversation, because absolutely people need to perform, but it's about being curious to understand why this person's performance may have dropped off rather than just immediately going into performance management mode. So tell me, um, I spoke to one business leader who said, if you have the personal conversations, the performance conversations are easier. But if I'm a CEO, do I, because I'm on, I'm at work, do I have a, you know, a personal conversation 
or do I have a performance conversation and separate them and tell people, how do I actually judge that? Or do I just have a conversation which takes in personal and performance? Yeah, I don't think we need to separate them out. I think we, um, uh, you know, a good performance, a good conversation goes to what the manager or the CEO is seeing that is of concern to that person. So I think you need to call it um, and then to say, uh, I'm here to try and understand why, uh, you know, why does it, and I'll go, I'll go simple here, now, why does it you come in and late every day? Why does it you're not getting your work done? Can, a genuine um, curiosity as to what might be happening in that person's life, which will mean that they'll go into probably work and personal issues. And then I think there's also a real um, commitment from that person to walk alongside them to order to fix it rather than just say okay now you go along and sort that out you know yeah. it's, it's about that genuine care and support how do you so for you how would i create that connection because often and i was thinking about you know our discussion before i jumped on and i'm thinking you know in my life as a as a rugby coach or um you know all all the things that i sort of did Sometimes you start your relationship on the wrong foot. It might be a bit too cold or it might be a bit too emotional. So how do we teach CEOs to say, this is how you should start to create this? Because it's very hard going backwards. Yeah. You know, I, I, I might just share, JK, there's some work from an amazing woman um, uh, in, the, in the States, um, Donna Hicks, who talks about dignity in the workplace and dignity in leadership. Wow. And and she says that dignity is different to respect. So dignity is every single human's um, sense of, of worth, which we have from the day we're born. And she says that's different to respect, which respect we earn. And she says mm. that if, if people always treat people with dignity, then those conversations become easier because you know, you may disagree with the person, but it doesn't give you the right to, um, or you might be upset with the person, it doesn't give you the right to yell at them. If you treat people with a basic and acknowledge their inherent worth as an individual, no matter who they are, that's the start of those conversations. Without dignity, you can't get well-being. She talks about dignity and well-being as being essential partners. And I think there's some real value in that idea. You can't have a performance conversation or even a well-being conversation if it's not based around your genuine belief that that person has worth no matter who they are where they sit in the hierarchy what their religious beliefs what their sexual orientation people have worth that's the basic unit i, th I think that's beautiful i've never heard that before um because th that's really interesting that respect is earned but dignity is is should be just a given yeah and yeah. so if you're a CEO, if you start with that, then you're, you're going to be genuinely interested in the background of the person, right? Yeah. So yeah. you'd yeah. start by saying, if I'm going to build the dignity between us, I have this right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have this curiosity to understand where you come from, you know. Yeah, um, and how, how do you cross those that line, though, Dr. Henry? Because, some, you know, I talk to some CEOs and they go, well, do I have a right to be, you know, in someone's personal life? Well, I I think you as 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 a as a as a as a CEO or as a leader, you have a right, you have a duty of care. I always go back to good health and safety language. You have a duty of care. And your duty of care is to the person's physical health and their mental health. So absolutely you have a right to go and have a conversation with someone if you are concerned about them. That person has a right to say to you, I don't want to have that conversation. Um, I'd rather not. But if that person, if you thought that that person was a risk to themselves or others, then you have a right to go in and say, we do need to have this conversation, I think. So, you know, I think it's about acknowledging, uh, going right back to your duty of care to people, to that, that in the workplace, that the work shouldn't harm people either physically or mentally so yes I think you have that you go into a conversation but I don't think you can ever say to someone you have to have this conversation with me unless you really feel that that person is going to be harm themselves or harm someone else that that uh that dignity thing I think has got some some real legs because um it resonates and I think if you are genuinely interested in someone's um 
you know, background. And, and we, we spoke about this before. You know, I believe it was easier for our parents to switch off because they had easier psychological moments, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, because this is JK theory who didn't, you know, left school at 15. But, you know, my dad would drive home at the end of work and nothing would follow him. He'd go home on the weekend and nothing would follow him. So, you know, I firmly believe now there is no work-life balance because we psychologically don't have the tools to actually switch off. It's something we need to learn. So it all is molded. And is that, do you think, over especially the last 20 years, changed how we have to deal with people? And what if, and I hear this still, right? I hear this still, Dr. Hillary, I hear this. I have these beautiful people in HR um, and they're real down our pathway, you know, well being's the future, you know, but my boss just doesn't get it. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> he's well, old yeah. school. Yeah. And I go, yeah. okay. So a lot of them ask me, how do I approach that conversation? And I have a, I have a real answer for that, but it's not technical. I say, this is the future. And if he doesn't get on board, he's going to be out of touch pretty soon. But that doesn't give them the tools that they need to no. talk to a no. boss, right? So that's where I think, um, I think in this space, because um, I think, well, let me go back to it. I think you're right. I think the pace with which life is led now, um, and, you know, you send an email, there's automatically a response that there'll be, an, you know, a reply within a few minutes compared to how parents live their lives. And I'm sure at their time, they thought it was really, really busy. But, it, you know, there is this huge pressure on us. So I think there is a good, there's a design piece in here, JK. I think that we all have some personal responsibility to look at our lives and say, how are we designing our lives? I know, and, and, and similarly, a workplace has a responsibility to be able to design work well but even at a personal level um a lot of the work i've been doing recently i've been finding that what i'm is that people that people don't take time to restore even as simple as they don't take time to to take lunch at 10 minutes at lunch and just go and sit in the sun go and sit in the smoker room and talk to people they sit and eat at their at their desk so there is a sense of there's no restoration and on the phone yeah yeah, yeah. So you, that's, I think that, and that's what conversation I've been having with a lot of people who are saying, oh, you know, the workplace um, needs to be changed. And I get that. And I totally think it does need to change in many ways. But at another level, we can also take some responsibility. We can design things. So, uh, you know, at a very personal level, and I'm not saying I get it right, because, you know, I, um, and my children will often say to me, you know, you go around the country telling people, you know, things, but look at how you do it. So I'm not suggesting I get it right all the time. But um, what I try and do is like, is Saturday is a day for me to restore. I don't touch my phone. I, you know, I don't come and do my work. Of course, if I absolutely got pushed, I would, I would bend that rule a bit, but I try and keep that as really as sacred as I can. And, and that's a design piece. So I think we can, I don't think we're very good at always saying there are little things that we can do to actually give us some restore time to help us reclaim, to you know, charge the batteries. And in the workplace, what I'm seeing is that, you know, and, and you will have experiences as well. People just roll from one project to the other. They don't even sort of wrap things up before, they don't even take time. I was in an organization this week. They don't even, they won a major big tender. They didn't even take time to celebrate that success wow. before moving on to the next thing. Yeah. And that's not uncommon. I think the interesting, also the interesting thing about that, um, you know, there's a beautiful Māori saying, and, and I need to learn it properly in Māori, but it basically says, to have hope and faith in the future, we must first stand on the shoulders of the past. Yeah. Right? And yeah. sometimes we, we'll get criticised in this generation to, for forgetting the past. But, you know, our parents had morning tea, lunchtime and afternoon tea for a reason, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah. now we're not taking those moments. And also there's a big guilt factor around that because there's this work hard you know, to try and get ahead. How do you break down some of those really strong beliefs? Oh, yeah, let me, uh, you know, um, if I knew the answer to that one, I'd probably be sitting on an island in Fiji somewhere. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, but I, um, I, 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 another person that has guided my thinking over the years is a, is a, is a guy called Viktor Frankl, who was actually um, a, in a Jewish uh, in, a, in a concentration camp during the war, and he developed a whole psychotherapy 
based around his experiences in there. And, you know, and, and he's written a little book, which I would recommend everyone reads. It's a very, very thin little book called, you know, um, A Man's Search for Meaning. And he says there that people who, he, says, he uses a lovely example. He says they were walking back one day after being out, you know, doing hard labor and they were going back to the camps and there was an amazing sun um, a rainbow. And he said one of the, one of the one of the people with him stopped at the risk of being beaten up for stopping um, to admire this rainbow and he said he at that point he realized that people who um, no matter what situation in can choose to see some beauty something bigger than themselves something else there they the people that that get you know they are the people that will survive psychologically better they're happier they so it's it's something about how do we get ourselves back to the to move out out of the sense of what does success look like? You know, so sometimes yeah. happiness is just simply being able to appreciate the small things around us. And 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 he, so his he has uh, actually I did actually look at it uh, as some some of his thinking because I thought um, he said uh, this little quote I'll share with us is those who have a why to live can bear with almost anyhow. And wow, I think that's I classically that. beautiful as well, which is actually, if you know what's important to you and then, then you know, the how, how it will happen is can so will maybe sometimes sort itself out, but it's really important to know what it is that is happiness. And I think we've lost that. I think that for many people, there's this pursuit for what success looks like. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the well-being piece has given us a great opportunity to help organizations understand that success doesn't only equate efficiency and productivity, but a, a successful organization is one where the people are thriving. I was, I was really, really fortunate, Dr. Hurley. I had amazing, um, I had two amazing wise parents and they had no reason to be wise, if that makes sense. So when I thought about wise, you think about, you know, Mandela, all these people lived all these life's experiences, but my mum and dad were incredibly wise. Dad was a butcher, mum was a housewife, right? But incredible, uh, gave me an incredible thing. My dad said to me once, um, and I'll, I'll swear, so excuse me, because um, he, I said to him one day, dad, what's success? And he said, how many bastards want to carry out when you die? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, and when you think about that, you know, he was a butcher from Mangere and the church was full. There were yeah. 600 people there. You know, there should have been 20. And people rang me and wanted to, um, to carry him out. But he asked me a really hard question. I want to get back to this because yeah. it helped me. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to one of your quotes. So um, he said to me one day, JK, if you died tomorrow, would you be happy? Wow. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. it, and, I, and I couldn't answer it. Anyway, we had this discussion. Um, and I said, to, I came back and I said, yeah, I want to see my, you know, and I came back with all the classic things. And he said, no, nah, they're just givens. I know that. But he said, if you died tomorrow, would you be happy? And my answer was no. And then I said about making sure, I don't want to die tomorrow, but I'm, I, I went yeah. about making sure that if I do die tomorrow, I'd be happy. But this is really interesting because I had to, and it's, it's created a bit of turmoil in me, Dr. Hillary, because design your work or design your life I quite, and I've, I've written both down. So when you talk about design your life and make sure you put restoration in yeah. there, they're actually quite cold words. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. if you go, oh shit, do I have to design my life? Yeah. What, what, what are you yeah, sort of so saying? What are saying? So let me give you an example to make this uh, maybe one, maybe maybe more tangible. So, um, my husband, um, who has a chronic pain problem and has had it since he had an accident when he's twenty two, his design, what he his non negotiable is to go to the forest on a Saturday morning with his mates to ride his to do mountain biking. That's a design piece for me. He's 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 all he's he's choosing to do things that he knows he can he has a you know good time to have a good laugh with his mates. He's out there having some exercise. They try different tracks, so he's learning to do something a little bit differently. And and that's a choice he makes, and it's a non-negotiable for him, you know. And so that's what I mean is where you actually you know we have some choices to make. I mean the other quote that from from Viktor Frankl that links to that uh, J.K. is he says. Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of human freedoms, the choice of the attitude we, we choose, you know, and that's what he was saying about this person, you know, that that person chose at that moment to say, actually, I don't care if they beat me, 
I'm going to appreciate that simple rainbow and just the beauty of what sits in there. And I think that's what I mean by design. We can choose how we run, how we do our life. I know, I know that sounds, I know that not everyone has I mean, the same choices as other people. I get that. But but no matter what what Frank was saying, even in the midst of the bleakness of what situation they found themselves in, this person chose to do things. And so that's what I mean by design. You can act, we can choose. I mean, I've read, I've read hundreds of those books and really, you know, I didn't do any study when I was at school, but I'm really intrigued about the war, really um, in, intrigued about survival, especially the plight of the Jewish. I've read Five Chimneys, I've read all those mm. stories. And the ongoing thing through that is actually this, this, this sort of hope or seeing every single day having these moments yeah. where you are hopeful. I think restoration is is an interesting thing that I want to talk to you about too, because I do it on a daily basis. When you're designing your life, I'm going to call it. Um, so I'm designing my life. So I think everyone over the summer break, um, COVID needs to let us all be more reflective and make some choices. And I think that's been the positive of COVID, okay? Hybrid working is going to be a thing of the future. So we should sit down and design our lives. So when you think about restoration, uh, putting your um, psychology hat on, do different people need different? So I need it every day in three or four forms, all right? Do you only need it once a week? I mean, do you need to understand <laughs> no. yeah. what that looks like? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, it, it, it is such a subjective thing, isn't our well-being? So it's certainly not one size fits all. And it's certainly different people find um, different ways of restoring themselves. And... Um, I think, though, um, we, there are some key things that we know are really important. So when you look at, if you think of the mental health continuum, the people that generally tend to thrive more than people that struggle, there is some evidence to show that these people do quite different things. And so there's a design piece in that. So the people that thrive better generally are, are good at keeping their relationships and keeping connected. They do a little bit more physical exercise. They are very curious about life and they, they are open to new experiences. They also um, are very giving in the sense of not cash, but appreciation, thanks and acknowledgement. You know, and the other one, and maybe it goes back to your father being a very wise person, JK, is they're very in the present. And so they're not or they're not regret, they're not living their lives regretting the past or anxious about the future, but they really appreciate and acknowledge what's in around them themselves. And, and you have to work quite hard at that, don't you? Because it's yeah. so easy to go back to, oh, if only I had done that, or when this happens. And so you're really missing out the immediacy of what's going to make you happy, which is right around you at this point in time. But we need to, we have to make an effort to do that. Yeah. And that's I think the design piece for me. Oh, and totally. And I think for me, you know, the one thing that that simple question that my dad asked me, um, I only have today. So I need to put all those things in my day, right? Because if I do die tomorrow, then I need to tell people that I love them. I need to make sure I look after myself. My work needs to be rewarding. And, and, and you know, so all those things have come in to my design of my yeah. day and what that looks like. I think there's another, you, you and I have spoken about this a lot of the times and you know some people of our generation and above they talk about the new generation not having work ethic and all that sort of stuff I, I think the new generation amazing I think they're asking us a lot of hard questions about the environment about a whole lot of stuff I think they work incredible hours but they'll also uh, be off like a robber's dog if you don't look after them so you know how do we start actually uh, where do workplaces start on generally showing and leading that to sort of keep new talent? What do you think the, are they millennials or what are they now? I don't know. <laughs> I don't just, know. I just, I, yeah, I, I, I just I, call I, them the 18s to 35, <laughs> way younger than me, you know? Well, I, I, I have a son who would fit into that category and I, and I, I know that he reflects on me and he's, and I know he says, mum, I ain't going to work quite as hard as you. And it's not because that's any disrespect from him, but it's him saying, actually, I think there's different ways of doing our life. And I think that generation, and I think, you know, the whole thing we see now about the great resignation is a group of, there's, there's a generation of people out there saying, actually, what is going to make us happy? And maybe happiness is not, you know, progressing you know, fast up the ladder at the cost of a whole lot of other things about life. So 
you know, when when he says, look, I, I, I don't want to have to work longer than my hours because actually I want to get out and play some tennis with my mates or I want to go and do something a little bit different. I, I, I admire that. Now, I think they're much stronger around um, getting a balance than, than, than maybe a few generations back were. So the, the, the interesting thing, if we are like the workloads for me, are something that is very, very hard to turn down, right? So, you know, people say to me, you know, restructuring because it's all about profit. You know, we restructure, there's 50 people less and my workload's gone up. I mean, how do we actually start getting some real change, especially moving into 2022 to yeah. help build mental yeah. health literacy, create a psych psychological safe environment? Because it means your boss has to be able to give you the permission, right? How do we give people the permission yeah. to actually turn that yeah. shit off? Because it's going to be there tomorrow. So people say to me, JK, it's all right for you. You're not going to have 200 emails tomorrow. And I'm going, yeah, you're right, because I don't answer emails. I hate them. No. But JK, I think that there is a strong senior leadership, executive lens, board lens on the storyline, isn't it? Which is, and it goes back to the fundamentals of what they see as a successful business. And, uh, you know, I had this conversation just last week with a, a, a successful business, this family business growing really well and very successfully. And the work is just massive. You know, it's almost like they talk about a wall of work. Um, and it's hard to push work down because, you know, that's them that's how they become successful they've just done everything that they could take but I had to have a hard conversation with them because at the end of the day they have to decide what success looks like and if success looks like this business is doing really well but I never get home to see my kids much before nine o'clock or you know as they were saying to me and we work most of the weekends and actually everybody's doing that that's not sustainable you know so I think, and I don't think we're there yet, but I think there is, if there's well-being peace, it's all very well for the people that we will interact with, you know, that are committed to this thing, like your, your health, your HR people, your people and capabilities, they get it. But it's actually the people at the top that have to choose to do it differently and actually say, well-being is one of the criteria for a successful business, that a, that a business that's only successful on the bottom line, but not but is harming its people mentally, that's not a successful business. And I know they actually buy into that. So a lot of our work, I think, is to, is to actually have those hard conversations right at the top of organizations. I, I often say this, you might've heard it before when I've been on a webinar with you, um, and I totally made this up. So, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, 35, 40 years ago, Bill Gates drove across the Canadian border with Microsoft in his back pocket and said, I'm going to put a personal computer on everyone's desk and they're going to do this. And they did. And then Steve Jobs comes along with the cell phone and says, yeah, I'm going to give everyone a cell phone. And that just about happened. And the world changed. Technology has accelerated. Mm -hmm. Our availability has accelerated. Like when the cell phone first came out, I used to love it because I'd go, surfing and i can answer the phone right now it stops you going surfing <laughs> you know in this modern world how do we actually create some psychological safety around um we don't need any more tools to make us more efficient <laughs> no know? no so how do we actually promote to, to people because when you say design your life and i'm going to go away and have a real strong think about this and if i was running a business i've got to design my business life for my people. If I'm a CEO of a company like you just mentioned. So how do we actually sit down and go, what is important and what is not when there's profit involved, when you might have yeah. some goals, you know, like it's this capitalism is completely out of control, right? So how do we, how do we start the conversation where, yeah. okay, what does success look like? If you're in a, if you're in a yeah. concentration camp, success might be just getting through the day and seeing yeah. a, another rainbow you know like yeah. but the reality is there's cars you know we've got mortgages we've got all this sort of stuff that actually are, are, whether it's true or not they're pushing us to overwork uh, oh look I, I think I always say to CEOs um, when I work with them is and, and and I get quite a lot of pushback and I think people get a little bit irritated with me but I always say to them workloads the devil you don't look in the eye mm. you know um, and and so when we go back to the design piece, the frame that I tend to use um, is there's these two things here that sometimes will get them to pay attention. One is they have a clear obligation in the space. Not that I like to go to a legal uh, uh, lever, but, but it is absolutely clear that 
uh, work should not harm people physically or mentally, and therefore they should be paying attention to this. But I think what I really would more encourage into you know your question earlier about the mindset piece the mindset piece is to help people to see this work through the lens of opportunity what is the opportunity to an organization to understand what risks people's mental well-being to understand what protects people's well-being and to proactively go about designing out those harmful factors, workload being one of them, bullying and harassment being another, lack, lack of psychological safety and a host, the amount of organizational change being another, um, but also to pay attention to the things that protect people. Because what I find is what protects people, what most people will say to me is, it's working with my colleagues, it's my team, it's, my, it's the connections, it's the relationships I have. But we don't design work for relationships. We put people in silos, we put them behind little desks that they can't talk to each other. You know, so a design piece is actually understanding that one of the most protective factors for people is really good quality relationships. Are we actually organizing work that enables people to, de to, to actually keep, develop and keep those relationships? So that's the opportunity um, yeah. rather than doing it just because we've got a legal obligation. And that often is a frame that, that people, many, many senior leaders haven't really seen it through that lens, which is, you know, the opportunity is there is, is um, you can actually create an environment that people could maybe go home better off than they come back and then they come to work, you know, and yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I think the interesting thing and the biggest fear for most CEOs that I talk to is they are scared that it's going to interfere with their profit. Right? Yeah. But what we're saying is that a happier work person um, will be more productive, you'll retain better people. And I, and I firmly believe that. I think the other question I had for you is another, another thing my dad said, um, you know, he said, when you're my age, son, and you look back on life, you wanna make sure that your work environment um, is one of being really rewarding because you're gonna spend more time with your workmates than you are with your loved ones. And I'm going, wow, dad, that's pretty heavy. But you know, so it's many of us, us, so yeah. many of us don't actually bring our authentic self to work. How, if you're a CEO, how do you start saying to people, right, we want to design a workplace where, where we want you to be yourself. We want you to, you know, be authentic. We want you, you know, when you're looking back on your life saying, should I've got 200 people I work with at my funeral? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know that people don't, I think most people will choose to bring the authentic self to work. It's that the work very quickly teaches them or, or that actually it's not always that safe to be who you want to, who you are in the workplace. Mm, okay. And so I think that, um, you know, that, that that fundamental building block of psychological safety that I mentioned earlier on, which is people have to have a sense of, of a, a, a belonging and a sense of, that's the, one of the most basic human needs that we have. And, and we can do things right from the day, you know, first induction of someone into a workplace could can tell them all sorts of things about how they, whether it's going to be safe for them to be who they really are or not. Um, but that has to be done in a considered way, doesn't it? It's not just going to happen. Um, and the person that's going to have the most impact on whether you're happy at work will be your immediate supervisor. Because yeah. that's the person you're going to have, and or your team leader, that's the person you're going to interact with most for. And actually, we haven't done a really good job providing that frontline leadership with um, the skills, the mindset, the capability um, to really show that they care, because they're often being put under the pump to deliver the, the yeah. outputs. And so they naturally, well, I mean, that's that's where their attention goes. We have to flip that. We have to say, you, you know, we're going to hold you accountable for as much for having a well team as we are for a productive team. So we have to start changing what we measure. So you've, you've been into hundreds of businesses. Tell me, um, or might be one or two amazing CEOs that you've come across that have actually created this. And what, what were the traits? What were the, some of the things they're actually saying or doing on a daily basis that helped create this? Yeah. So so what I would say, JK, rather than seeing it as, as, as physical characteristics of individual of these years, I think it's what it's what I would refer to as their practices, actually what they do, because that's what people will see. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I go back to the work around uh, dignity. I think they do treat people 
with a genuine sense of worth. They don't, uh, they don't belittle people. They don't humiliate people. They genuinely interest in, in not just in what the person brings to work, in what the work requires of that individual, but they know something about their families. They know, I'm not suggesting they know everything about their families, but they'll know whether maybe someone's lost a parent or, you know, they, they actually have a, they have a curiosity about their staff in a way that um, means that they can really connect with them. Um, they are, they've also show a vulnerability, you know, they are willing to say, actually, I don't always get it wrong. I mean, right. Mm -hmm. um, they tell their own stories about how they battling. I, I remember during COVID early in the first lockdown, um, working with a, a, a senior leadership team and um, the senior lead, the, the CEO had actually had, had said to his team, uh, you know, I'm actually struggling at the moment. And someone came to him after that meeting and said, you know, thank you for saying that because you've just given us all permission to be able to tell it as it is for us. Up until now, we've been feeling like we have to hold it all together because you look like you were holding it together. So someone has sometimes been able to be vulnerable and um, and actually tell your story is really, really powerful. I'm, I, I had this amazing moment in my life way back in, way back in the time. Craig Green and I, we played together and, and we got invited by Luciano Benetton, who owned the Benetton company at the time, to fly on his private jet to London. So here's the old butcher and the builder jumping on a private jet. We thought, oh, this is interesting. We'll, we'll spend a lot of time, you know, talking to this guy. And we couldn't get a word in. His curiosity for everything about us was, it, it, it was really it took me aback. So, you know, we're, we're living this experience and we're hoping to talk to him about how he become a, you know, billionaire and all that sort of stuff. But he was so curious. Yeah. And yeah. do you think that is a, something you can learn genuinely or is it just part of you? No, I think it's, I think, I think it comes easier to some people than others, but I think it's a practice and so we can develop it. So mm -hmm. my practice that I try and do in that is when I get in a cab, as I do often as I'm going on my travels, I always strike up a conversation with the taxi driver as to how their day has been and try and get some understanding of who they are and what's happening in their lives. And it always strikes me how interesting their lives are. And, you know, yeah. sometimes how, you know, you've got highly qualified medical doctors from Iraq and they can't get a job. And yeah. but just just showing a curiosity and, and, and treating them with, with dignity and actually wanting to understand their story is so powerful as a connector. And so I think you can develop it. I absolutely think you can, you've got it, but you've got to, it's like any, it's like any sport, isn't it? You, you know, you, you might have a basic um, ability, but you only get really good through some additional practice as well. You know, and a lot of practice probably known, you know, as you would, as I'm sure you would well know. Yeah, you I mean, uh, here's another thing I'd like to ask you. So, also actively listening is that something you have to Absolutely. practice because you see me writing it's not that I'm distracted it's because I have all these questions in my head and I'm not a great active listener because I want to ask you another question so I write stuff down <laughs> and that's how I become an active yeah. listener I have a very close friend um who said whose mother said to her God gave us one mouth and two ears for a purpose <laughs> My, my, my beautiful mum used to say the same thing, exactly the same thing. But it's, but it's also when we're listening, isn't it, JK? There's, there's different, there's listening and listening, isn't there? Um, and I know uh, my, my children have accused me in life to say, you listen to find a solution for us. And, she, mm -hmm. and they will say to me, sometimes we just want you to listen, mum. We wow. don't want you to find a solution. We just want you to listen. And that's quite hard, um, you know? And I think in the workplace very often, managers are listening to find a solution and of course solution is coming through their view of the world not necessarily from the other person's view of the world so I think it's yeah listening is obviously a really key and and again we have to work at being a good listener yeah look and I think it's a real challenge for parents right so I am so that um because I think it's my job to have the solution yeah. but I often talk about um I don't really know the world they live in, so why would I have the solution? So sometimes I need to listen more, but I need to practice that as a parent, you know. And I and I read a book called um, Learned Optimism, which was a a way to to I, I read it to be a better coach actually, but it actually taught me to ask open ended questions instead of giving solutions, which yeah. really really helped me because we want to have the answer, but we don't, you know. Yeah. What would I know about? 
yeah. online trolling, yeah. bullying, you know, whatever that is now. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that's really actively listening, curiosity. What what would be one of the other? What what where do you put these things? Because the thing that you've thrown me today is you've talked about it a beautiful emotional time, but it, you've got you know design your life, which sounds a bit cold, which I love. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on that. But you know, I, I say to people, I am not my emotions on my values. Right. And that's really helped me during this time because I've been angry, I've been frustrated, I've been anxious, but I know it'll pass if I come back to my values. Where do you put curiosity and listening in some of these other things? I don't call them values, but what other things do you think people need to have to create this great environment? So we've got curiosity. Well, um, well I think I, I think I think knowing what's important to you, um, having spent some time understanding what's important to you is also fundamental and there's some lovely research that was done years ago in an organ in organizations which found that if you really wanted your people to be committed to your organization you know um, you needed to give them an opportunity not only to understand your organizational values but understand their own personal values because if there's a misalignment between your personal values and the organizational values um, the person's not going to stay and actually organizations very seldom give people an opportunity to reflect on what is it that they want to try and achieve out of their work and whether this is a good place and a good match for them. So um, in terms of, 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 of the research, it shows that when organizations don't spend as much time saying, this is what we believe in, and sometimes those things can be a little bit glib, I think, but actually you give people to what's important to you, which is the way the work of someone like Simon Sinek comes into play where, you know, he says, you've got to understand your why. Mm. And, you know, and this is, you know, it's the back, uh, that's why I love this quote from Victor Frank, where he says, those who have a why to live can bear almost anyhow. But we don't often, so go back to your question, JK, I think it's important for us to take time out to understand to what, what is our why. I don't think we we I don't think many people are quite clear. Like maybe that's what your father was asking you, you know, when he said, you know, what, you know, would you be happy? You know, are you doing what's important to you? Do you even know what's important to you? Mm. And that can change too, right? Absolutely, yeah, you know? yeah. You know, so the design piece again. You know, um, my my design piece over the last while is my my daughter. Um, you know, lives in Queenstown. She was having her first child. I didn't want to be a distant grandmother. So I just, I, I said, I'm going to move because that is, I don't want to be someone who's, who doesn't have an intimate involvement in, in this little girl's life. So I was fortunate. So Lux part of this is fortunate as well that I was able to do that, but I could have just stayed in Auckland um, and, and not seen her. Yeah. So we have choices to make, you know. Um, I've come to the, come to the part that I really enjoy because it, it meant to me, you know this because you're a big yeah. part of our business. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, so I've got some questions for you. Yeah. I'll, I'll just remind the listeners why we do yeah. this. You know why we do this. Uh, we're trying to find the ultimate recipe for a great life. So we're trying to design, we're trying to get you to design your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That's right. You know, I'm going to use this. You know, <laughs> you know, you know I'm, the biggest, I'm the biggest stealers of things, right? Well, I was talking to a, a, very, a very great friend of mine. You must be a magpie. We're all magpies on life. Yeah, yeah. As long as we're looking after. So, that, you know, the six pillars, yeah. everyone knows it's my daily mental health plan. It's what I do every day to um, mm. restore myself. And I love that word as well. So what do you do to chill? What calms and relaxes your mind? Um, I, I, I walk every day. Um, just And, you know, where I live now is, is really beautiful. So I walk. Um, I just take some time to chill and actually just um, be myself. I have until recently um, had a dog, which I loved and used to help me walk. I, I will take time out to read. I will uh, spend time with my family. Beautiful. I'm sorry to hear about your dog. I mean, yeah. we, we've got a we've got a dog which I take the Mickey out of, but he certainly they certainly become part of the family. Yeah, and I've got yeah, a personality. Yeah. Mine, so. my, mine was 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 deaf and uh, a deaf and blind, and so I was really caregiver for two years of literally I went after looking after a geriatric father to looking after a geriatric dog I used to say to my friends are you, go, are you going to get another one no I think I'm not going to for a while because I have my daughter's two dogs that come on a regular basis so oh, okay. I'll, 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 I'll use I'll be, I'll be a surrogate owner <laughs> um one of the things we've spoken a lot about today um and I think this is one thing that people need to do when they're doing their design of life or design of work connect how do you connect um, 
I, I, I'm quite caught, I'm, 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 I have, I don't ha have a raw, a raw, I have a lot of, lot of people that I know, but I have a few really close friends that I connect with on a regular basis. I will either give them a ring um, or I'll, you know, my family and I'll go and see them. And interestingly, and I mean, this is a bizarre sort of thing to say, JK, but I recently have started um, doing my family tree. Mm. And I have got such enjoyment out of it. And I said to my husband, I wonder why I'm finding this. And then I realized after some reflection is I actually am connecting. I'm connecting because, you know, I'm um, being an immigrant, you know, you've moved away. You haven't got all those connections, close family around you. And it's given me such pleasure. So it's an unusual form of connection. Um, it's so important. You know, our suicide, rate, past, yeah. Yeah, our suicide rates are where, are where our youth especially feel disconnected, not connected to their, to their past, to, to the land. I mean, yeah. I also think a connection to the land is important. I mean, I love blue health. I love the water. You know, I, love, I think we also need to, you need to design that into your life as well. So a connection and knowing your past, I think is intriguing. Yeah. That's really yeah. good. And now just on that, I mean, you, you, you've you just, I mean, I, I can't believe I didn't actually say this, but one of my, my, the way I chill on most weekends is go into the garden because I think being connected to the land is really important. I'm never happier than when my hands are in the midst of some compost <laughs> <laughs> or I've picked my own fruit or whatever it is, yeah. So the next one is do. So what do you do to be creative or what hobbies do you have? Yeah, so that is my, that is my hobby. Yeah. Is I'm a young man and I'm an avid gardener. And to move, you've said you, you, you go walking a lot. Yeah. Do, do anything else? Yeah, I swim. I swim, I try, try and swim twice a week and I walk. And um, if my husband had his way, he'd get me on a bike, but I'm, I'm more of a walker. <laughs> and I, I do run. I used to run half marathons. I haven't put as much energy into that of rest but i, not, I haven't signed swimming, up for next you're not swimming in that lake are you that'd be pretty cold no 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 i'm swimming in a heated pool but nice. i have signed up for the queen sun marathon which got um, postponed for covid for march next year so that's my goal Good on you how do you celebrate <laughs> we spoke about this before and i think to any business leaders out there don't forget to celebrate you know, even the littlest of things, it's really, really important. So how do you yes. celebrate? I, I, I've had, well, I've had a practice over the years of if I, if, if I've been through a hard week and I want to celebrate that I got through the week or whatever, um, I will go and buy myself a bunch of flowers or I'll go to the plant shop and I'll get some flowers. And when I look at them for the whole weekend, I'll say, good on you, you got through that week. So it's a really simple practice I've done for years, but it's, I it's love that. I've me. never thought of that. I think that's 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 a something that you really learn. enjoy. But when you see it visually, you think it actually reminds actually, yeah, you know, good on you, you did that. And what do you do to just have fun, enjoy? Uh, uh just have fun, enjoy. Um, uh, just um, I'm I'm just to be with my family, really. Just yeah, you know, spend that's as much good. time as I can with my little eight eight months old. And uh, oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. Something to look forward to. A quick fire now. So uh, getting towards the end, who do you admire for having great habits and behaviours around well-being? Yeah, that was an interesting question, JK, and I gave that some thought. And, you know, um, very quickly came into mind, I have a very, she's a colleague, but she's also a really close friend. And she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis probably about 20 years ago. Wow. And I have such admiration for her because she's never let that... Um, that health issues become so she she's very active she she goes to the gym and she walks and she cycles she gives back into her community because um she'll go out collecting for multiple sclerosis her husband's a really good painter this year she created a calendar um which she has um promoted through her little business which is called speaking confidently um, and all the proceedings are going to go to multiple sclerosis and I think she does all those sort of chill, connect, do things in a way that has not always been easy for her to do. And she can, I thought she really is, uh, in my mind, someone who to, to look up to, to, to be well has not been easy for her, but she does it really well. One of, one of my um, daily things that I do is I look for inspiration. And I think that's also, you know, when I hear and, and you know, you talk about your friend, for me, if you look every day, you'll find that inspiration, you know, and I think yeah. it's important to go looking for it. So what are you reading right now? Oh, so what am I reading right now? Well, I've got a pile, <laughs> I've got a pile of books um, which are really too, way too, too, too um, work 
orientated. So I need to actually find myself something to read that's a little bit more lighthearted for, for, the, for the holidays. But at the moment I'm reading a little book called The Six Practices to Master the Art of Thriving, which is really not that helpful, you know, in terms of, of, of being a chill. But, but that question did prompt me to think, and actually what I have revisited fairly recently again is that is that is that Donna Hicks book on dignity um, which that. I would really recommend people to read it's such a great story it's such a great book in terms of what is the key fundamental cornerstone of getting this right I just read the Venetian sketch book for exactly the same reason I was going to bed I was reading you know books to try and make me better and I, and, and I was activating my mind so I just went and downloaded the first book I, I live close to Venice I love Venice. it's called the Venice sketchbook it's okay it's yeah. really really even my sister liked it so there you go yeah. um you there know, was enough romance in there there was enough romance in it there for her and <laughs> I, there was enough Venice in it for me you know <laughs> can I share a little story with you when I was um oh, probably about 10 years ago I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I was going into hospital and my daughter's and I, I was going, so I went to the library and I got a whole lot of work-related books to take to hospital with me. And my daughter came back and she said to me, mum, you are not taking those books to hospital. And she gave me The Kite Runner because yeah. I hadn't been reading novels for a long time. And so I took The Kite Runner and it was a, it was a great book and it was a good it was a really good caring moment on her part to say to me, no, mum, come on, you can just take some time and look after yourself and just read something else. <laughs> yeah, just to turn the mind off, right? Yeah. What podcasts are you listening to? I don't actually listen to many podcasts, to be honest. Okay. I can't, you know, I thought I could make one up, but I thought, no, actually, no, I don't, I, yeah, it's not my, it's not my way of normally, of normal learning, so. What keeps you awake at night? Um, I... <sighs> Uh, the thing that probably would keep me awake most at night would be if there was something in my kids' lives that was mm. being a challenge to them. Yeah, that would be the thing that would keep me awake most. What I don't do you think, think is an open mind? Ah, uh, for me, an open mind is around um, tolerance, acceptance, um, being open to new ways of thinking about things, new ways of doing things. I think those are the key things for me. Just and, that's, and it's just it's it's a reverse of that I suppose JK that's that's made mental health in the workplace so difficult is that we haven't had that open mindedness and that acceptance and that non judgmental uh, view. Um, yeah, I think tolerance is a really really important one, um, and you know I think yeah I'll investigate that next time. It's a word I've just written down. Um, who should I interview next? I think you should interview my friend next. Yeah, I was <laughs> going to do that. I was going to. I was going to say. I think um, your friend. So I'll, I will get. Uh, yeah. I'll get yeah, the, yeah. the details yeah. off you. you know, do, do you have any final messages for our our listeners and anything that you think we might have missed or something you'd like to share? Um, no, I, I just think my final message would be is you know there are we just an acknowledgement that we all struggle at times um, and and that that's okay and that um but we don't have to get stuck there that there's things that we can do and it's okay to go and ask for help and it's actually important that we um take time out to look after ourselves rather than just this incessant sense of keeping going it's actually just sometimes just take some time out pause reflect and appreciate what we've got here here i just think that um, you know, I'll go back to it for all the listeners out there. You know, we're not our emotions, we are our values. And if one of your emotions, and I talk about the battery, the AAA battery, you know, awareness, acknowledgement, and then action. And often we'll be aware, we'll acknowledge it, but we don't take the action to actually yeah. look after ourselves. And yeah. It's, yeah. it's okay. It's okay, people. It's okay not to be okay. Yeah. But remember, the AAA, awareness acknowledgement but then put the action in place you need a few days off take it you've got to take an yeah. afternoon off take it you know yeah. you'll be way better for it doctor yeah. it's been an amazing conversation oh. i go on for hours thank you <laughs> thanks um, okay time, time yeah. is a uh, time is something that is very precious so i really appreciate the time you've given me today and oh, i thoroughly really enjoyed, enjoyed it i've got, it. And, uh, I've got a whole lot of questions. notes whole lot of notes 
<laughs> and I'm going to be sitting down over the weekend and see if I've got the design of my life right. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Beautiful. I mean, yeah, because it's not, I mean, luck is part of it, but actually it's a lot about choice and design. That was the, what, that's what I was going to say as a final comment. It's a, it's a, you know, luck has its place, but we can make choices and we can, we can choose to do things differently. Yeah. Thanks, JK. Thank All right. You take care. Bye. Bye.